the uh, Japanese yen. So just take a look at like risk assets, so like stocks and crypto. Bitcoin is a proxy for crypto. So chart one, um, this is just S and P E minis um, as well as Bitcoin. Uh, and overlaid on that is the yuan, and I've inverted USD CNH for this chart so that you can see like white line going down, that's the yuan going down, vice versa. So before April 20th, which is that red line, USD CNH was stable, risk assets weren't being driven by yuan prior to that. After that point though, it's just been slammed and risk assets have been highly correlated and driven by that down downside move. Um, uh, next chart on chart two, this is just the intraday over the past two days, including the bloodbath uh, from yesterday. And you can see that's basically been nearly tick for tick, especially with Bitcoin. Um, so that's just, you know, basically China COVID zero is really taking a toll. The macro data from this week has just been abysmal beyond already super pessimistic expectations of, you know, from the lockdowns, like heading in industrial production, retail sales, worst reading since March, 2020. Um, like the retail sales came in at like minus 11% versus 6% expectations. Um, Shanghai, not one car was sold in a city of 25 million because they're under lockdown <laughs> for two months, right? Um, that's incredible. Yeah, so, that's, and, so when you're yeah. talking about all this weak Chinese and you're putting the yuan chart up, this is because what? Because people were thinking that, okay, China's going to save the day here, like yeah. that their uh, economic engine is going to kick into gear and help, or that the authorities are going to recognize the weakness and they're going to come to the rescue. So even though we have the Fed hiking, we're going to have China accommodating. Was that the that the line of thinking? Yeah. So basically, you know, the reason I showed that, like, that line uh, is because, you know, prior to that, it was obviously things like the Fed tightening and all, and all that, um, and the various other macro factors, the geopolitical factors and all that. But like at that point, you know, there's been a, a huge sell off in equity markets and all that. And who is still left like not selling right at this point? It's people that are basically like hinging on or, or depending on the policy response from from China to come, which they kind of verbally verbally comes, but it's never really come to fru to uh, fruition. And mm -hmm. then you start seeing like horrendous data and you don't really see any sort of follow through on the policy front. Um, and so that's what's like getting that last, you know, um, bit of hope from any sort of major global central bank uh, policy, you know, accommodation to to come through. And it's just not coming through. Um, yeah. So there's been no, nothing to offset that, um, you know, the the, the 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 weakness. And and we saw like latest SEC filings data this week just showing that everyone had already sold or a lot of people had sold. So, who you know, the people who are still left are the people who are counting on the policy support that just, you know, hasn't been coming. Yeah. Um, so what about bond, what about bond yields? This yeah. is the other area that and I mean, you may, and this is an excellent point you make you bring up, Weston, that, you know, we have to look at the full global picture um, because it is sort of very layered here. So what about bonds? Because you you hear sort of traditional headlines here in the U.S. and you're like, oh, it's a, you know, safe haven trade. And you get the idea that it's just people leaving stocks and going into bonds, which may be true. But is there any dynamic that we're not paying attention to that you're seeing that we need to know about? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, so over yeah, over to bonds, like namely the the long end of the of the uh, treasury curve. So this is uh, again the treasury market. It, there's many participants globally. There's a thousand reasons for people to buy and sell. There's not one single driver. That said, I'm looking at the Japan flow. This is the like the long awaited Japan flow that had been absent um, from its seasonal pattern. Um, and so that's been both uh, kind of behind both the, the sell-off from March and the recent cap and yield. So if you look at chart three, um, so starting at like, you know, at the beginning of March when 10-year U.S. Treasury yield was at 1.7%, dollar yen was at 114, which seems like an, like ages ago. So from March to the first week of May, um, if you look at Japan, Japan foreign bond investment, Japan had been net sellers of over 6 trillion yen in foreign bonds. Uh, for nearly 10 weeks straight, half of which came in the last three weeks prior to this this latest reading. And then just yesterday, we got last week's reading. And from May 9th, after returning from Japan Golden Week holidays, Japan finally became a net buyer of 370 billion yen. Um, and over that same time period, um, we saw Treasury yields uh, top out at 3.2% uh, and down to 2.8 current and then dollar yen you know, down to whatever it is, a 127 handle uh, now. And if you can see that in the second, ch uh, the chart after that as well, um, that's kind of more of a, like a zoomed in picture. Um, but you can really see this, like, um, this stark, like, you know, clear division of when 
the accelerated selling going into Golden Week uh, happened from Japan and when uh, yields started to fall back down when they returned from Golden Week because Japan is very underweight. And Japan, frankly, will buy, um, you know, U.S. Treasuries even with, you know, uh, like hedging costs that take out a lot of that um, U.S. to Japan, like yield spread, like, you know, that, that gap, essentially. Um, even though the hedging costs might be astronomically high for Japan, it's still better than 25 basis point cap that the, the Bank of Japan is doing. Um, and and either way, Japan is it's, it's in need of yield, period. And so they don't really care what gasoline costs are doing in the United States. They're gonna it's gonna be almost an unconditional buyer of U.S. Treasuries, and hence it being the largest um, creditor to the United States. Wow. So, Weston, do these charts have uh, predictive ability? You know, what, what do you think happens from here? Is this suggest that if Japan's going to keep buying, that we could see yields keep moving lower or at least a, a cap on them now? Uh, I, I mean, if they have predictive ability, I certainly haven't figured out how to predict from them. <laughs> but um, my, I guess, yeah, my, my view for the last week has been, uh, so Brian, if you put up chart, um, the, the, that last chart, the chart five, um, so my view has been to, you know, been long yen. Uh, prior to this, I've I've had this like straddle trade on, if you will. I've been basically, uh, you know, sh- like short short yen, long U.S. Treasuries via options. But that short yen, I flipped to a long yen position because um, my view is that really doesn't like nothing really needs to happen. But there is a massive, massive overcrowded position in the short yen position, as you can see um, on futures from the uh, asset management community, that net short yen is like the highest on record. And also at the same time, you also have Japan retail uh, that is net long USD, the the most net long USD also on record. So you just need to get a old fashioned like classic short squeeze in the yen and you can get a a face ripping, uh, you know, yen um, rally. Um, and, And my point with that too, is that I don't want people, however, to confuse that with the yen has been rediscovered as a safe haven asset or anything like that. It's it's not. And, you know, this is just huge, like, massive overpositioning that is just being covered. So let's not, like, kind of conflate the two either. It's so important. And I actually heard heard that recently, um, Weston. So important to point that out. Face ripping. Ra- I, I, that's enough to make everybody stand up and pay attention, I think. Um, Weston, great stuff. Thank you so much for pointing all of this out. I mean, that's why I love these conversations and the ability to bring folks like you in to the conversation so that we can kind of be smart and look beyond the headlines that are being fed to us. So thank you so much for that. And I know you're going to be continuing to dig into it. So um, if you want more information or or to follow this line of conversation in terms of, um, of course, follow Weston on Twitter, but he's going to have it in his next West on trading update on our YouTube channel. That's right. Correct, West? Indeed. Yes. Awesome. Okay, great. Um, We'll check that out. Weston, thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks, Maggie. Thanks, Peter. Great stuff. So Peter, that was a that was a lot to take in. Curious about your thoughts about that, but I do think it underscores the fact that you know we're in a really tricky environment now, right? Where there are all these cross currents that we need to be aware of. Well, I'll start with with what Weston said about uh, Japan because I think it's really interesting and uh, the the inflection points that 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 we're reaching with the yen and and yield curve control and Japanese buying of U.S. Treasuries. We saw the uh, the, the Treasury. Uh, international capital flow data this week, and it reflected uh, Japanese holdings of U.S. Treasuries through March. So it is somewhat dated, obviously not including April and uh, the few weeks into May. But through March, their holdings hit the lowest level since January of 2020. They're down about 100 billion off their highs, and I think that's important because foreign flows generally into U.S. Treasuries. So foreign holdings of U.S. Treasuries as a percent of U.S. marketable securities is at the lowest level in 20 years. And this is happening at the same time the Fed is not only ending their purchases, but obviously shrinking the, the, the holdings of U.S. Treasuries by uh, $60 billion a month starting uh, in a few months. QT will start in a few weeks, but it will gradually get to 60. Banks, uh, as a percent of bank assets of treasuries and agency MBS, it's now at about 20 percent, which is at a a high. So it then begs the question of, okay, how much more can banks buy? Uh, Foreigners are not going to increase their their purchases and can actually start selling as Japan is and as is China. And the Fed has backed away. So we need 
we need other buyers to step in to keep rates from going much higher from here. And at what level attracts other buyers like pension funds, individuals, institutions, and, and so on. So I think that that's a, a really important thing to watch. And also with respect to the weakness in the end, we know it exaggerates the cost of Japan importing energy, among other things. Uh, it has less of uh, a boost to their exports because China, Japan has done a lot of uh, offshoring of their production closer to where their customers are. So they don't get the beneficiary of that uh, weaker yen. And we know that the Japanese consumer is getting squeezed just as any, everybody else with higher inflation and how much yen weakness will uh, the Ministry of Finance uh, tolerate. At the same time, the Bank of Japan is continues to be full speed ahead with their yield curve control. So how this plays out will be really important to watch. And with respect to China, obviously with a European recession likely, Japan, I'm sorry, China, the world can't afford a China shutdown with mm -hmm. respect to supply chains and with respect to the, 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 their, their, own, their own economy. We, we, we need China to get out of this, this, uh, this approach and we need China to grow. We need a smooth uh, transition of goods throughout not only uh, their side of the economy, but what they export to the rest of us. So it, it's, um, it's crucial that, that China starts to grow again. So irrespective of what you think about Xi and the authoritarian uh, government that he has and everything going on, we need Chinese growth uh, to help the rest of the world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was an incredible, incredible data point from Weston. Like not one car sold in a city of 25 million. It gives you a, a sense of the sort of enormity of what we're dealing with. I mean, that's just that's just remarkable. I, I want to jump into some questions um, and welcome. Welcome to the conversation, everyone. Um, JPW, Mason, John, Ross. Uh, this is from JPW on the exchange. Um, Peter, what market or economic factors could cause a deeper dip for equities? And I know margins are something that you're paying really close attention to. Yes. Yeah, so if you look at the, the, the market uh, over the past year, let, let's take let's assume that February 2021 was the top for the broad market. Uh, that, that, was the, that was the peak euphoria because that, that coincided with, with, with uh, the meme stock craze. So let, let, let's, let's take that as the peak, just as March 2000 was the peak at, at, at that bear market. And since then, through the rest of last year, we started to see this multiple compression in a lot of the high-flying stocks. And that's all it was through the end of last year. And then we fast forward into this year. And up until about a month ago, that was still the case. It was sort of a rolling correction in everything that had a high PE multiple. But I think we're making sort of a transition in this bear market where we've had the, the PE multiple compression, which I still think will continue. It's not going to end here. We'll continue. But now we're sort of worried about the E part of the PE, where earnings are going to go. Uh, and what we saw this week is profit margin compression is now sort of joining uh, this, this bear market and that coming off uh, record highs of only a couple of quarters ago of very high profit margins relative to history. Now you're seeing this supply problems, the inflation that's catching up to you know, that part of the, the earning story. And then I think from here on through the rest of the year, we have to start worrying about the revenue side because global growth is slowing. We talked about China. Europe is likely in a recession. U.S. growth is, is naturally going to slow as monetary tightening uh, continues to, to constrict uh, the interest rate sensitive parts of the economy, markets, and so on. So I wrote this morning that it's, it's essentially a perfect storm of multiple compression, profit margin compression, and, and the likelihood that we're on the cusp of, of revenue uh, slowdown which makes it tough for um, U.S. stocks from here and, and global stocks as well, but mostly U.S. stocks that are still uh, expensive as trading it even with this sell up 16 and a half to 17 times, but times earnings estimates that I think are unrealistic. So as earnings fall at the same time, PE multiples are falling. That's a, a, a tough combination. Yeah, and and nobody knows this better than you, Peter. Teaser, Peter, 
uh, was a guest for my podcast, My Life in Four Trades. It's going to come out in the next few weeks. And, and in it, you'll you know get a, a sense of your real understanding of the balance sheet, Peter, um, which is really needed in a time like this, right? So kind of crunching those numbers and saying, hang on, this doesn't add up. I mean, how much downside do you see, though? How off are those expectations and how much more of a rationalization kind of for this new environment do you think we're in for? I mean, is there a lot more pain ahead? Well, let, let's take current earnings estimates uh, that really haven't changed much this, this year. In fact, they've actually risen up until about a month ago when they, they peaked out. Um, according to my Bloomberg, we're at about $227 a share. I'm talking specifically, of course, about the S&P 500. Uh, those earnings estimates topped a dollar higher, 228 Now, let's just say that the Fed is not able to achieve a soft landing and a hard landing is more likely in addition to continued uh, fall in profit margins, let's just say we clip that number by 10%. So let's just say around $200 ends up being realized. And I'm just you know, throwing this out there because I think it'll, it'll help instruct people of what the possibilities are uh, on the downside since it is, it is a bear market. Well, let's just say at the same time, okay, so let's just say the multiple at 17 times stays where it is. And let's just say $200 a share. Well, that gets you to 3,400 in the S&P versus today's close at uh, right on 3,900. Well, let's just say that multiple comp compression continues, and we go to 15 times, which is not out of the realm of possibility. It's in fact the average of the last 100 years. And why can't uh, multiples still compress with inflation being as high as it is and interest rates up pretty rapidly this year? Well, what if it goes to 15 times? Well, 15 times 200 is 3,000 in the S&P. Uh, now, I'm not saying we necessarily go there, but I think these are, are the possibilities when you, when you think about what's the multiple we're going to end up paying on what I think will be a likely EPS number. Now, there'll be, there, there are probably some stocks out there that have already bought it. I mean, we're, if, if February 2021, as I said earlier, was the peak in this bull market from a broad stock perspective and sort of peak euphoria, well, maybe we're a year into this uh, plus uh, uh, into this bear market and bear markets last 18 months, 24 months. And now it certainly has metastasized, which is what typically happens in a bear market. You know, getting back to that 2000 analog, uh, the Nasdaq topped out in March 2000. The S&P didn't top out until late August, early September and then caught up with with tech and, and bottomed in. Uh, October 2002. So that's sort of what happened here. We had the frothy stuff top out February of last year, and the S&P didn't top out until January this year. And now, obviously, everything is 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 weakening. But like I said, you can you can argue that some stocks have already bought and then have seen the worst of the bear market as it sort of spreads into other things, particularly the bigger cap tech stocks, mm -hmm. where so much money has been hiding out in and, yep. and continues to do so. Yeah, and, and I, you get a sense that's some of what we've been seeing this week, certainly. Mason from the RV site has a great question. Peter, could the Fed get a soft landing in the economy, but with a result, result in hard landing in markets and still be considered successful? Are you thinking about the real economy? Can, we, can the real economy get by, but we see asset markets just in you know, a world of pain, as you were just talking about? It, it is a great question. Uh... And, and my the, my one th belief in thinking that is difficult to achieve is the and I refer to this the ancestral nature of monetary policy, asset prices, and the economy, and that when you think about the direct sort of influence of asset prices on the economy is let's just take the the the, the consumer and break it down. The lower end consumer is now getting crushed by inflation and falling real wages. Take the, the upper decile of consumers, where about 40% of retail sales or consumer spending is done by the top 20%, that are going to be very sensitive to fall in asset prices. And, and more so now because so much of household wealth is in equities, is in the stock market. And if you look at a chart of net worth, as a percent of disposable income. So it was a way of sort of defining net worth relative to you know, the average you know, the economy. 
uh, that is well above the 2007 real estate peak and well above, which was well above the peak of March 2000, which was the tech bubble. So we're so reliant on asset prices. Asset prices are so elevated relative to just disposable income that I think if an unwinding of that will have its own at least psychological effect on, on higher end consumer spending. And keep in mind that you know, a lot of consumer spending, for those that can afford to spend, some of it is just psychological. If, mm -hmm. if your stock portfolio is down 30%, if you feel 30% less wealthy, whether it's your 401k or your, your individual portfolio separate from that, you may, it may change your, your spending decisions. You may, you may defer things. Your balance sheet's fine, and, and you, can, uh, you, you could do the deck in your backyard, but you may defer that spending decision. You may defer that vacation decision. You may defer certain big ticket things, which you add that to a slowdown in, in consumer spending for those that are getting hurt by inflation, and that has a direct economic impact. Then, of course, financial conditions flows through the capital markets and, and funding companies. And we have a very low default rate right now. Well, now that we have rising interest rates, a lot of lower rated companies have a lot of floating rate debt. And all of a sudden, their interest costs are going up. Yeah. At the same time, as the economy continues to slow, their cash flows are going to shrink. And you're going to have a default cycle ahead of us. Well, a default cycle leads to bankruptcies. It leads to uh, cost cuts, which include layoffs. And that leads to job losses, which then, then further exaggerates its impact on the economy. So I think it's going to be hard to thread the needle of, okay, let's just have the, that, the hits of the markets, but not really affect the economy. Now, ideally, the Fed would be okay with that. They want to have only, they'd rather have more limited impact on the economy and care less about where the stock market goes. Their worry always is that, well, as the stock market goes, so goes the economy in this twisted reverse way that, that Greenspan and Bernanke and Yellen and Powell created. Um, but I'm not sure how we can separate them out to, yeah. to I guess, the bottom line, uh, the answer to the question. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, and I'm going to, you know, that, that sort of has implications for yields, but we'll get to that question in a second. I did want to ask one from Ross. Uh, if a down, downtrend in yields continues, would you think this coincides with a larger drawdown in commodity prices? A lot of people wondering about commodities and, you know, if they've been in them, whether they should take money off the table there or have they had their run? Well, with respect to yields, I'm very confident that short-term interest rates have peaked because I don't think the Fed is going to raise as much as the market anticipates. Longer term rates, I still think is very much a question. Now, rates have fallen. You know, they got you know above three. Now we're about 285. They really haven't fallen that much. I think the the, the difficulty in predicting longer term rates from here, and one thing that I've that I've talked about before is that, yeah, we can easily look at inflation and growth and say, okay, this is where the 10 year should go. But I think what flows through, what has to th flow through that analysis is what happens to the European bond market as the ECB tries to get out of their policy. What happens to European, now European bond yields obviously have already adjusted a lot. Uh, I mean, the German 10 year back to 1% and the pile of negative yielding securities shrinking to almost nothing. So we've had a, a, a big reaction, but how do we go from here when there's no QE and, and all of a sudden there's positive short-term interest rates in Europe and how that policy progresses? What happens if we wake up one day and the Ministry of Finance says to the BOJ, you know, we, we can't have this yield curve control. We can't have this weakness in the end because this inflation uh, situation is really hurting people. And the BOJ raises that, 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 that yield curve control ban to 50 basis points or even 75. Now, of course, that'll blow up the, 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 ban, the, the Japanese government's finances, but let's just say it happens. Well, you can get another earthquake in, in long-term rates where the 10-year goes back to three and a quarter or three and a half or, or higher, even if short-term rates stay low. Now, tying this into commodities, I think we have to be just be – now, I, I think there's a structural bull market in commodities, and that a lot is mostly on the supply side where there's a constraint on supply in many different commodities. 
And I think that we're, we, 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 we're seeing that for sure in energy. We're seeing that in industrial metals. And uh, certainly with the, the war in Ukraine, we're seeing certainly shortages of, of key crops like wheat and corn. Uh, so I think that that structural supply challenge is going to remain with us. So the demand side now is what we have to try to figure out. Now, energy demand is definitely more inelastic than, say, um, industrial metals that is going to more, be more sensitive to Chinese growth, for example, and global growth. So while I'm bigger picture, very bullish on copper, to use that as an example of an industrial metal, I'm not sure how it trades in the short term because of the, that slowdown in demand that we're going to see. Over the next five to 10 years, the demand for copper is just going to be tremendous as more EVs are built and they consume more copper, among other, other things. Uh, but I'm not sure as in the short term. I'm more confident that energy prices, particularly natural gas, has more upside. And uh, so I like energy stocks better, particularly the European ones, where you can buy some of the European energy stocks that are trading below where they were pre-COVID. So really haven't captured much or, or haven't captured all of, of this rebound, particularly high prices. Now, precious metals, if you want to put that in the commodity bucket, which I look at more as a currency rather than a commodity, I remain very bullish on that. And I think agriculture, I think the, the crop prices will continue to go higher. And I think they'll surprise to the upside. Uh, playing that like via fertilizer. I think we're beginning to see some demand uh, uh, pushback with respect to fertilizer. So uh, I'm more bullish on crop prices relative to fertilizer, even though fertilizer prices should stay high for a while. Yeah. We a question from uh, it's I, I think we're, you're starting to touch on that. So let's expand on it from Look Mano Brains. I love these names from the RV site. What's your glass half full synopsis? We talk a lot about the you know, the risks and the, and the bear and the downside right now, what's your glass have full synopsis? Well, I'll start by, by talking about something that ties into commodities of being a boost to commodities. Let's just say China gets off the zero COVID policy and China opens up and says, you know what, we, we have to accept this. We're going to focus on vaccinating those that are 80 and older, and we're going to let COVID rip and treat it like a cold where China opening up to the rest of the world would be a huge economic boost. But it would also be a huge boost to commodity prices, which then sort of would juice this inflation story. Uh, the, 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 the glass half full is that inflation is peaking out. Now, it's, it is peaking out on a rate of change basis. The question is, is where does it settle out at? I'm still of the belief that it settles out at 3 to 4%, which is double where it was pre-COVID. Uh, but at least it's a moderation from what we've seen. And, and I think that... We, the glass of full is if that if the Fed is successful in softening inflation, not on a, just a, a quick multi-month basis, but something more, more um, sustainable, which would then allow them to take their time in, in resetting policy and would be another glass half full. Um, and an end to the war in, in, uh, in Ukraine. That Russia yeah. says, you know, like, okay, we're, we're done. We completed our, our mission. Uh, now, I don't see that happening anytime soon because Ukraine's not going to want to cede any land. But let's just say it does. Well, then maybe we can get a fall in energy prices that would alleviate this inflation pressure, particularly in Europe, where uh, particularly on the gas side, they've seen a shock. And if we can get some alleviation there, that would certainly be a positive as well. Yeah, that's a great point, Peter. And we've been talking about that behind the scenes um, here at Real Vision. You know, we've all been kind of everyone, the mindset seems to be, you know, in for this grind happening there. And if you were to see something, um, you know, with the market focused elsewhere, that that could certainly be a, a surprise. John A. from The Exchange, we're going to squeeze a couple more in. John A. from The Exchange, DXY and 10-year yield weakened today, but oil strengthened. What should we make from these moves? Well, oil really is disconnected from the dollar. I mean, the oil goes its own way based on the supply demand uh, dynamic there. And I think the, the strength of the dollar really hasn't had that much of an influence. And just quickly on the dollar, I mean, 70% of DXY is euro and yen. And up until, call it a month ago, the dollar has only been strong against the euro, yen, and the pound, generally speaking of the big currencies. Uh, because of the rise in commodity prices up to a month ago, the Brazilian real was at a multi-year high. The Mexican peso was at a multi-year high. 
The Aussie and Canadian dollars traded well against the U.S. dollar. Even the South African rand had a nice move against the U.S. dollar. It's only over the past three to four weeks has the dollar rallied against everything. But you know, oil has proven to be trading on its own, like I said, supply-demand imbalance. And uh, I think it's going to continue to do so irrespective of where the dollar goes. Achilles from YouTube, what do you make of the high growth names rallying hard today? Is it short covering? I think you mentioned if this, if not Weston did. Are, are we seeing some of those, the bottom for some of those beaten up names? Or is this just one of these, you know, upticks in a bear market and you have to beware? I mean, it can be a short term bottom. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if even the S&P uh, trades up to 4,200, which is which was the level of support in February, March uh, into April. And then now I think would probably be a level of, of resistance. Um, but some of these stocks, great companies, you know, Shopify, for example, great company, but, you know, still valuation challenges, not with, even with this sharp pullback in the stocks. But like I said earlier, there, there could be parts of the market that are closer to bottoming than, than others. And um, so they, they could be reflecting that. I still think that there's there's more to go in, in, in this bear market. Uh, but like I said, the, the, there's certainly some stocks that are closer to the bottom than others. I mean, I, I was looking at, you know, going back to 2000 again, just to use that as sort of uh, an historic reference point. And it was interesting. We look at some old economy stocks and I looked at Norfolk Southern, you know, old economy railroad compared to the tech stocks that were trading in, in early 2000. Interestingly enough, Norfolk Southern stock bottomed in December 1999, a few months before the tech bubble uh, peaked out a few months later. And Norfolk Southern actually traded up through that, 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 that tech stock implosion. Mm. So just getting to the point again that, that, that maybe some stocks have, have, have seen the worst of their bear market, where others, there's a lot more to go. Absolutely, which is why a lot of people having a conversation about, you know, not just blindly buying an entire index now. Um, you know, you may have to 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 dig underneath it and and look at the individual names a lot more. And something have we haven't had to do. A lot of people haven't had to do in a long time. Peter, active fantastic stuff. Go win. ahead. Active management's going to win for the next couple of years. That was said before, but you feel like it's different now. Well, we, we go through we go through the pendulum swings where passive yeah. works and active is left for in the dust and then vice versa. And now I think passive will be left in the dust and, and, and active will win out. Even when passive is in vogue, I mean, I, I don't think you can replace really understanding what you're investing in. Right. Like understanding the underlying business. And you made your career on this, but but you should know you should know what's going on with the, the individual yeah. names. You hold. know, a lot of passive is actually active, too. Uh, yes, yes, every, that's right. Every decision is an active decision, however you want to define it. That's right. Great point. Peter, always great to catch up with you. Thanks so much for being with us today. Great conversation. Thank you all for the fantastic Thank questions, you. as always. Ash Bennington is going to be here uh, same time tomorrow with Jim Bianco. So be sure to tune in for that. We're going to give you a little clip about how to find out more about the great conversations we've been having around, you know, the global recession, questions about interest rates uh, just after this. So check that out. And in the meantime, take care and good luck out there. It's a really complicated world out there. We've got massive inflation, recession fears, war in Europe, COVID, China issues. What the hell's happening? Everyone's got an opinion, but who's right, who's wrong? As co-founder of Real Vision, I've got my own view, but maybe I'm wrong too. And I want to go and find out more from real experts, real in-depth analysis. And I've hand-chosen my experts for this two-week journey of discovery in global recession. Is everyone wrong? I've chosen people like Peter Zihan to talk to them about geopolitics. David Rosenberg about the economy and Pierre Andran, the world's most famous energy trader, about how to navigate the oil markets and where it's all going. This starts on May the 2nd, and I'm going to learn so much about what really is going on and how to best navigate it. Yes, not everybody's going to be saying the same thing, but it's going to allow me to piece together an investment framework to navigate these complicated times. Now, normally we'd give you seven day trial for one dollar, 
But because this is so important for all of you, and I think it's one of the most important pieces of content we've ever done, we're extending that free trial for two weeks for $1. So you get the entire campaign of all of these great minds. And it's only $1 for all of this. So just go to realvision.com forward slash global recession to find out more and join me as I try and figure out what the hell's going on.